I'm super stoked for today's episode. We've got a guest and an old friend, Daniel Vitalis. We're going to be sharing a conversation with him that's going to be wide ranging. But first, I want to read a little bit about Daniel from his website. Daniel Vitalis is the host of The Wild Fed on the Outdoor Channel, which is now in production for its fourth season. For 10 years, he lectured around North America and abroad, offering workshops that helped others lead healthier, more nature-integrated lives. A successful entrepreneur, he founded the nutrition company SirThrival.com in 2008. He's a registered Maine guide. He's a writer, a public speaker, interviewer, and lifestyle pioneer who's especially interested in helping people reconnect with wildness after learning to hunt, fish, and forage as as an adult. Daniel created Wild Fed to inspire others to start a wild food journey of their own. Headquartered in the Lakes region of Maine, he lives with his beautiful wife, Avani, and their plot hound, Ellie. Daniel, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. I should probably add uh, that we now have our other plot hound, Diaz, who is the son of Ellie. Oh, nice. Uh, so we have a mom and son combo uh, dogs now. Very cool. How are they doing? Amazing. He's still a little bit crazy. Uh, crazy. So don't, don't leave shoes and socks around, but uh-huh. otherwise, very well. Very well. Yeah. I love a well behaved dog. Do you take any time to train him? <laughs> yeah, actually, we do. But um, I we could do more, of course. You know, like I wouldn't want Caesar to come over the house on a typical <laughs> evening. I but, love his uh, show, Caesar Milan. Yeah, I like him a lot too. Um, and then there's another show um, I've been seeing, K9. I think it's like K9 Rescue or something like that. On Netflix, more of like a L.A. kind of hmm. like urban sort of former gangster type dude or from that kind of world. That's like, right. Yeah, I've seen that show one. is awesome. Man. Mm-hmm. That guy's incredible. Um, yeah, I love the world of dog training. And that whole study of, I guess, operant conditioning is powerful beyond the lessons you learn about dogs. I mean, it certainly applies to ourselves and no doubt meaning to or not meaning to. I'm sure like Daniel in your journey right now. You're probably using some of those exact techniques on yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that works great on dogs too. Yeah, yeah, that operant conditioning is a fascinating subject I had no idea about until years ago when you brought it up. And um, just I want to mention to the listeners or viewers that all the links for this episode, if you want to learn more about Daniel, watch all of his content online, you can find the links in the description. And remember, this is a video podcast, so you can watch it on our YouTube channel or watch it as a video on Spotify as well. So be sure to check out Daniel Vitalis through the links in the description after watching this episode. So Daniel, how do you use operant conditioning on yourself these days? I'm just really getting into it. Um, Like I told you last week, um, yeah, getting sober this time is so different because I think of the commitment level and the seriousness of it. So tremendous amounts like this wealth of emotional material has been coming up Mm. um, that has everything to do with early childhood trauma and conditioning. And um, I'm I'm seeing shit. I'm feeling shit that I didn't even know was there. I mean, I've done I've been on a pretty committed path most of my adult life Um, as far as like introspection, self-inquiry, looking in and doing lots of healing in a really grounded, real way. This time it's super different. And somebody turned me on to uh, Gabor Mate, which I I had never heard of him before. And I had the the opportunity to interview him once. He's incredible. Oh, did you really? Incredible, yeah. And uh, man, I resonated 100% on every single thing he was talking about as far as like conditioning environmental programming since childhood and how early childhood trauma has everything to do with like who we are, Mm -hmm. you know? And I understood that intellectually, but this time, having stuff really come up and looking at this material um, in a far more authentic way was just so different. And then in this podcast he did with Joe Rogan, he talked about uh, the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. So I'm like diving headlong into this material and it's amazing. It's extremely uncomfortable. Um, It's the grief process is Mm. extremely real. And Mm. it's, I mean, it's, my favorite work. It's really incredible, but it takes us a really serious commitment and a reevaluation of everything, you know, that I, I thought I was as a human being. Yeah. There's a lot there. Can I unpack some of that a little bit? <laughs> Please. Um, 
on on the topic of grief and uh, and I think shame might be dude huge the word I have a therapist that's told me that the research on shame is so scarce and sparse because the researchers shame is triggered doing the work yeah, so they wow. can't do the work wow so it's one of the fields of psychology that's the least yeah. explored because no one has what it takes to uh-huh. go there because yeah. we're all dealing with so much of it. Uh-huh. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, another piece I want to bring up is, well, the childhood trauma stuff. I mean, I think a lot of people almost feel guilty or ashamed to admit to having childhood trauma because we grew up in such a wealthy first world environment. Yeah. So it can feel like, oh, white girl problems or whatever. Totally. But but the reality is like a lot of us did grow up with a lot of trauma. And then, you know, Daniel, uh, David, what year were you born? 1980. We're 13 okay. months apart. So <laughs> I'm 78. Um, you're 78 too, Daniel. So we're all born around the same era. So if you remember that period of time, I think it's people know by now, cause it's kind of cliche to talk about, but this is the era of you leave the house in the morning and you don't come home till dinner time, and no one asks where you are. I'm out totally. jumping trains and riding them across right. town. I'm like, I'm doing all kinds of dangerous things. Like, no one's asking where I am. But one thing that really strikes me, and I got this out of um, reading um, The Fourth Turning by uh, Neil, Neil, oh, I can't think of his name. Anyway, the book, The Fourth Turning, incredible book about demographics. And in that book, he talks about the films of our childhood. Mm. And if you remember the films um, that depicted children often depicted them as terrible, evil beings. So you had like Chucky, oh you God. had like <laughs> Firestarter, mm-hmm. Children of the Corn, these kind of films where there were evil kids, Rosemary's Baby. Now, when you look at how kids are depicted a generation later in films, you know, we it flipped over to like the Barney kind of side of things and everything went super gushy feely and helicopter parenting came in but that was after us we were during an era where children were looked at as like kind of a real pain in the ass and maybe evil so at that time a lot of the trauma that we grew up with was just the fact that kids were more ignored yeah (laughs) like it was sort of some of it is was just built in not even just that you were being beat up or abused in some way, but someone was just built into the culture at the time. And then now we've shifted to this. No, every kid is special. Every kid gets a trophy. When we grew up, it was like, no kid's special. You're all worthless. Get out of our hair kind of a vibe. So that's another big piece too, I think, that probably needs to get looked at because our parents were from a generation, they were in like a type time of self-exploration the fifties had given ways to the sixties and seventies. And there was this expansion of consciousness and people were self actualizing and the kids kind of were like forgotten about a little bit. Oh yeah. And so that's the milieu that we grew up in. And I think that's fundamental to understanding some of the stuff we'll talk about today and how kind of we all got to be here because the generations change constantly. So it's not like this is a consistent flatline environment. It's like a waveform of, of very, um, like over parenting and under parenting. And we oscillate generation to generation back and forth between those. Yeah. I remember so um, countless times, my mom just saying, get out of the house, like go, like, I don't even care if you get into trouble, just Mm -hmm. like, don't get caught and don't get caught near the house. Yeah. (laughs) It was just like, go. And we, you know, we found all kinds of trouble, you know, cause that's just what young, younger boys are looking for. Used to fight. Oh Yeah. Used to get in fights. Remember, like parents being like, "Well, if someone, someone's, you know, says something to you, you, you punch him in the face." Like yeah. really different era yeah. that we were in. I mean, now yeah. it's like you get arrested. But it used to be right. Like people used to circle around and be like, "Fight, fight, fight!" And kids would fight. And I mean, you know, it's just a totally different time. It's remarkable. Yeah, it is. And like my daughter's mom, she has a couple of other kids. And uh, once they were like, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, they lived not too far away from the school that her kids went to. And she didn't even let them ride their bikes to school, which was like less Mm -hmm. than a mile away. Yeah. And I remember walking like when I went to high school, I was walking three miles or more by myself at like five o'clock in the morning to get to to school. I remember coming home from taking my SATs and my mom was like, where have you been? I was like, I just got back from taking. She's like, I didn't even know that you were like about to graduate. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, man. I, I also want to just mention on the, the topic of Gabor Mate, um, I had the opportunity in uh, Vancouver to see the area where he oh, yeah. had, had worked with, you know, a very, not just drug addicted population, but a, but a, a population of, of street folks. So I got to kind of see that environment and um, understand a little bit of like where he's coming from, like truly mm-hmm. a realm of hungry ghosts. Mm-hmm. And of course you can find that actually that I'd say those communities are expanding mm-hmm. um, under the kind of current, mm-hmm. whatever socio-political environment we're in, because now you can go find like encampments in any city. I mean, here yeah. in Maine, you know, it's amazing to me, but places where, where, where people are living at the edge of life and death every single day yeah. and addiction controls every moment of every day and like true desperation exists. Yeah. So also, you know, as we talk about addictions today and stuff, I just, cause as you brought up Gabor, I just want to say like that I understand as we talk about this, I'm talking about it from a place of never having had to be at that level. Right. You know, it's so frustrating to me today to hear conversations about homelessness mm. or, you know, what, what, what is the politically correct way to say it? There's like a, the unhoused or something. Unhoused, like that. That's right. Interesting. Because again, growing up and now what I understand was like a, a very left leaning media environment, which I thought was a balanced media environment as a young person. Same here. That I had the impression there was these people who had like lost their job and could never get a footing again. Right, And then over the course of my life, being an v- extremely eccentric, outspoken, pierced and tattooed wild child, I have never not been able to find work. I have never no. not been able to figure out how to make things come together. Right. And over time, started to understand like, oh, these people aren't like that because they just lost their job and couldn't. This is severe drug addiction and mental illness. Right. And the two things are obviously bedfellows. And it's so frustrating to hear the conversation around that world as talked about as if we're just talking about people who are down on their luck. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. And I had the opportunity once in Santa Monica, actually twice. I, um, oh, that's right. I did do an immersive, yeah, you went under urban survival course and go live amongst the homeless population there. Dude, we're not talking about people down on their luck. We're talking about a world of people that the average person in America could not, not only could not navigate that world, but not even begin to understand the rules of that world. But we're not talking about people who just, you know, got laid off. I mean, we're talking about people who are in very deep with the demons, you know, personal demons of mental illness and drug addiction. So anyway, I just want to say I recognize that as I talk today about my like addictions and my issues and, you know, the issues you guys have is like we've, you know, I would, I'm never going to sling around that word privileged. I can't stand the way that gets used today, but, but in its older meaning, we've experienced these things in a sort of more luxurious environment of mental health, I guess. 